What's going on, everyone? Tanner Poppet here of Madrost and Poppet's Corner. Just reminding you that our new record, Charring the Rotting Earth, is now available at nolifetomatorecords.com. That's right. Just go on the search bar, type in nolifetomatorecords.com, and support. Again, nolifetomatorecords.com. Now, let's check out the episode you came to see. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Poppet's Corner. I'm thoroughly excited to bring on the main man of Night Demon himself, the one and only Mr. Jarvis Leatherby. Jarvis, how are you doing today, sir? Thanks so much for coming on and giving me a couple minutes of your time. Yeah, thanks. I'm doing great. It's good to see you. And i um, glad we're here to have a, a chat about heavy metal. Absolutely. Well, so the basis of the show is <clears throat> I'm going to go through your entire musical career, uh, tell Ooh. some stories, and learn a little bit about yourself. So, if you're ready, I'd love to get started with you. Go for it. All right. So explain, give me the first time that you recall just hearing music for the first time, and what was the band for you? Well, my dad was in a band called Black Opal in 1969 to 72, I believe, uh, with Michael Anthony from Van Halen. Obviously, he wasn't in Van Halen at the time. So um, growing up, Van Halen was like the soundtrack to my youth. My dad and he remained friends for a bit. And, um, you know, my dad was a big VH fan. So that was a lot of the stuff that I was listening to. Plus, my dad would fuck around on guitar here and there. Um, and um, I started playing drums like, I don't know, maybe when I was like in the fifth or sixth grade. And um, I went to a Christian school, so I was like singing in the choir a lot, and kind of learning how to sing, which was interesting. It was all hymns and, and stuff about God and stuff. So I wasn't really I wasn't really connecting with that. But just the act that there was music involved, which is cool. You know, I think a lot of kids that go to public school that you know, music, it has to be kind of a choice for them. It's, it's not something that they're really exposed to to see if they like or not so that was one good thing about being in that system probably the only good thing <laughs> but uh um uh, i was playing drums and i took some drum lessons and um my parents didn't really want to spring for a drum kit because at the time i was just like i was doing all kinds of different shit different sports and stuff it hadn't really made up my mind what i wanted to do so to make that investment and to have me bashing away all the time in the house wasn't a thing so i had like a practice pad but when they would leave like when they would leave me home alone I had this cassette, this Freedom Rock cassette. It was called Freedom Rock. It was like a compilation of all these like American rock and roll songs. And it had like smoke on the water and stuff. And I would kind of just crank up the stereo and play along to that. But the first time that I heard somebody, this is kind of weird because of the journey that I took. But the first time I heard somebody play like acoustic guitar, like in front of me and like strumming chords all hard, I was just like, oh my God, like it just, it just did something to me and I was like, you know, I want to do that. So I tried my hand at guitar after that. Um, you know, I always tell myself, man, I wish, I wish I could hear music again for the first time, you know, like it's just, it's, it's something that like really resonated with me, not just like, Hey, that looks cool. Or, or, you know, I want to learn how to do something like that. It's just the feeling that I got like when it, when it like live, actually watching live music, like when it hit my ears, kind of the feeling that it that it gave me um is just so intense you know so uh now how how old were you kind of when you heard the uh, acoustic and whatnot and I'm i was just kind of curious like uh -huh. 10 years Go ahead. old or something i was probably like 10 years old but my dad had had fucked around on stuff but i don't know there was just this one moment this guy came over to our house and was just hey there's a guitar and he started playing and i was just like holy shit like like he was really good, you know, and and I was just like, man, that is just that's just so interesting to me, you know. I'm wondering why the drums at first, though. I mean, what about the sound of the drums made you kind of gravitate towards that at first, at at such a young age? Because we're talking the yeah. the mid '80s to to uh, to early '90s at this point. So yeah, it would be like early '90s. Um, so I, I, uh, I think I don't know. It was kind of like I, I could. It's funny, I can even tell in my songwriting now, I write in a very percussive style. A lot of stops, hits, breaks, you know, uh, a lot of accents. But uh, we, we used to have this class in school where they would give us drumsticks and teach us music theory, just 
you know, rudiments, one, two, three, four, four, four times signature and stuff like this. And I just kind of like said, Hey, this is pretty cool. You know? And I, and it was also, it was a thing where I don't know if it was kind of, I thought it was the easy way out, but it wasn't a really like musical instrument. You know, it was something where it's like, okay, you can, it was like, I'm a kid of the Nintendo generation. And so like video games these days, you have like 20 buttons and they're a lot more intelligent back then. It was all about, algorithms and we didn't know what it was called but it was like there was a system and there was a thing that it was a repetitive thing that you had to do and there were there were patterns you know so i think that kind of i related to it in that way it's so interesting and what were some of the kind of the rock bands that you remember hearing around this particular time period and to getting the you know or to hearing the acoustic guitar for the first time and 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 yeah so like be, yeah, so like besides like Van Halen and Deep Purple, those were the things that were like in my house all the time. Van Halen, Deep Purple, and Black Sabbath. Um, I like Metallica's Black album had come out, and so did uh, Guns N' Roses, uh, the Use Your Illusion albums that kind of came out around the same time. And I was like a kid of that MTV second wave, and like uh, I, Nirvana had broken really big, but I never got into it. Like I was just. It just never clicked with me. And I was I was way more into the heaviness of Metallica and the musicianship and stuff. And so that was kind of the first stuff that, you know, like in, in suburban, white suburban Southern California, all the white kids were always listening to rap and stuff at the time in the early 90s. And I was too, you know, and it was like, compared to the rap today, I mean, now now I look back on it and go, man, actually that stuff was pretty good. Like there, like, like there was a lot of skill involved and the beats were good and the, the, the mashup, the remix stuff, the musical parts were good. And the lyrics actually had some, like something intelligent to say or some, some context, you know? Um, but at the time, like once I found, once I really found rock and roll, I think like I was just way over that stuff. And um, it's hard because like when you, I don't have kids, but like when you, when people have kids, they kind of want to like groom them to do cool things that they like. But usually kids go the opposite way where it's like, Hey, if my parents think that deep purple is cool, then it's not, you know? So I, I, I think I, I was like that for, for a little bit. But then when I started playing, I was like, okay, they knew what they're talking about. Like this band is like legit, you know? Now, what was the first kind of instrument that kind of really hooked you into becoming the musician that you kind of are today. And, and, and what about that specific thing kind of did it for you rather than just, I don't know, not playing, picking up like a cello or saxophone or any of those kind of instruments. Yeah. I mean, there was always a clarinet kicking around in my garage and stuff. It was like that we had, we did have a like school band, but all that stuff was just kind of nerdy stuff. Like it, at least in my mind, you know, at that time, wind instruments, brass and, and woodwinds. And, and there was some percussion stuff, but it was you're basically just like a marching drum kind of guy. You know, it wasn't a, a full drum kit, you know, uh, but like, we, OK, it's kind of there's kind of another side to it. So like when when we were in Christian school, like kind of like in the junior high era, they showed us this video it was a three hour long documentary called hell's bells that was it's about like the dangers of rock and roll and they took like everything like they back masked stairway and they took these judas priest songs and said kids are killing themselves even like metallica's fade to black this is about suicide and i had never even heard that song before you know i um all I had known was the Black Album and, and Justice for All at that point. There was no internet, you know, so it was like you had the records you had and you had a limited amount of funds as a kid to go buy stuff. So um, what that did was um, there was like 30 kids in my class and they got they kind of most of the kids kind of bought into that. And they were like, yeah, like we need to rethink our lives. And the next day, um a lot of kids brought like CDs and cassettes and like LPs to school. And we had like a smashing party, like breaking the, it's basically like a book burning party, but smashing these, most of the kids had rap and stuff like that. I mean, there was some rock stuff, but me and another couple of guys, like we, we wanted nothing to do with it. And another, 
another friend brought in a, a Led Zeppelin CD and is like, hey, I'm not going to smash this. I want to like spread this around. I want you guys to listen to this. It was like the Houses of the Holy record. And I'm not a big Zeppelin fan, but when I heard that, when I took that CD home and I heard that guitar, that tone, I was like, holy shit, this is what I want to do. So like it backfired on them as far as I'm concerned. Like it really show, opened my eyes to what the cool things were about rock and roll and the rebelliousness and the danger. And I knew right away, like it was bullshit what they were trying to, to teach about it. You know, it, it was just, completely inaccurate and it was the satanic panic years and it was it was uh but it really i thank them for it it really opened my eyes to to what i've become today i mean it's been 30 years since then you know like so. sure well i i just want to want to go back to something you said that and so you, you wish that you kind of heard music for the first time over again i'm just kind of curious i kind of think that happens within each of each of our own musical palettes at least three or four times you know you hear a band where like it's like hearing music for the first time so i'm just kind of curious was that one of these moments where it was like this is like hearing music kind of for the first time and then jump starting yeah into, into playing in a rock band or, or yeah it was like it was i basically started my first band the next day you know uh but it was it was like i had been exposed to so many things that i from artists that I already knew of that I never knew about, you know, like ACDC, it's like Hell's Bells. I never even knew about that song. I knew about a uh, Thunderstruck or something, you know, and like Metallica Fade to Black. I didn't know that about Ride the Lightning. Uh, I just didn't know. Like we did, we didn't have that kind of exposure. It, it was like basically what was ever, whatever was on network TV or whatever was in a newspaper or magazine you could get and whatever, you know, if you were lucky to go to the record store, if you had 10 bucks, I mean, you had to go with a safe choice. We were watching MTV. They were talking about old school Metallica. They were talking about the Black Album. Um, it was stuff like that. It's, it's, a, it's a totally different time, man. It, it wasn't too long ago, but like nowadays, there's just such a open, there's, there's, no, there's no barrier to entry for anything, you know? And I think it's pretty awesome, you know? It's, it's great for... Now, like, I would like to hear music again now for the first time. It would just be like, because a lot of the old school metal that I love now I and punk, I, I hate it then because it didn't sound like the Black Album. Like, I wanted all my, that's the best, like, come 30 years later, I realized that's the best sounding metal album of all time. But that was my that was already my benchmark on day one, you know? <laughs> so, like, I would hear these old recordings of old school bands that influenced Metallica or Anthrax or Iron Maiden or whatever. And I would be like, man, this sucks. Now it's my favorite stuff, you know? I just, my ear wasn't tuned to it yet, you know? So, but I don't know. I've been to like 3,000 concerts in my life and I've played over a thousand. So um, my ears are a bit shot and <laughs> I'm just jaded and older and like, it's, it's real. It really, it takes something extremely special to excite me these days, you know? And so I just, it's hard for me to get excited about, about stuff that, you know, it's, it's just tough for me. And, and like, that's just because I've been obsessed with it and I've immersed myself in it for, for decades. You know, it's not because of, for lack, it's not because the stuff's not good. It's just to me, I've just, I've been experienced to so much of it. And I know so much about music and music history from, in all genres, you know. I think that's, that's, that's one benefit to um, applying it to your own songwriting and whatnot, which obviously we'll get into that stuff later. But I'm just kind of curious, what was your specific first band? Was it playing with your dad in, in Black Opal or was it just forming with your friends around this time or, or yes, what was I, the first band? I formed, and actually, our, my first band was called Black Opal. We took the name from my dad's band and because um, we couldn't come up with the name. I think we had a couple names uh, first. We were called Toxic Semen. And then uh, we were called Propane, but spelled like the band Propane. I, again, we had no idea they existed. Like we were in a record store and we go, oh, fuck, there's a band already called that. Um, we couldn't come up with the name, so we just kind of took my dad's old band name. And uh, but that was the first band that I was in, and we had we had no we had nobody to look up to in our local area. Like we were too young to go to shows, 
and we didn't know any other bands so we just kind of had to figure it out on our own and that's the point that the at this christian school they kind of took notice that we were doing this and we had played um like the look the school talent show and we did anarchy in the uk and uh and uh i don't think they were they were too stoked on that so they they actually recruited me to play in the church band like the church was starting to do a rock band thing for one of the services on sundays and so i started playing with in the church band and i mean i didn't give up my band or anything but through that i met older guys that were playing in like cover bands and rock bands and stuff and i would go to their rehearsals and i'd be fucking blown away dude like they like i mean they were just playing whatever was on the radio but like they were just good musicians man and these were guys like in their late 20s and in their 30s and like they were just really good and i was like man i mean that that really fast tracked me to, to like, this is how you do it. You know, like, like watching real guys play. It's so much different, man. Watching it in front with your own eyes up close, you really get a bit much better sense of how it's done, you know, but, but initially we had, we had nobody to look up to. Uh, I, I wish we did a, a lot of young bands start by just a kid at a show with his friends watching bands and going, okay, here's how we do it. We didn't have any of that. We, we had our records and we had like the big bands and we were like, why don't we sound like that? <laughs> you know? So. Well, so what did the school band kind of teach you that you still apply to Night Demon today? If that I makes don't sense. Know. Yeah. I don't know. Like, <clears throat> I don't know. I was playing in the church band and it was always like turned down. So like, I, I don't know. It was the opposite. You know, I'd bring my, I'd bring like marshals and stuff to church and they'd be like, uh, uh, like and use a lot of distortion they'd be like uh you know like play these open chords and put a clean sound on and that's when i just kind of gave up on that you know like uh i i don't so i i don't i don't know what that what that brought me today i think they're all just like steps to becoming what you are you know they're all just everything is adds a little a little part but i can't think i can't put pinpoint anything specifically from that experience that I still carry over to today, except for the fact that it was my first experience playing with other guys that were better than me, which is another thing. It's like, I, it's always good to play with guys that are better than you because your skill level rises very quickly at that point. You really have to get up there. You know, when you're the guy in my band, I was the guy practicing more than anybody and kind of showing everybody like, Hey, here's how we do this kind of thing you know when i started playing with other guys that were better and older and more experienced i i uh just kind of fast-tracked it a bit i like it i I like it so what were some of the um reactions to uh this black opal project that you were doing and 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 the first shows that you were kind of doing as a musician uh were you playing bass at this time or guitar and singing or yeah i was playing guitar and singing and uh we had a really hard time when we were young getting gigs. I still have like, I've always kept a a journal and a a diary like my whole life. And um, I just, I do it. I've done it every day, you know? And and I, I I look back years ago to like the things I was talking about. And it was always like, it's like, I forget sometimes how hard it was to get a gig when you're that young. It's, it's like, we just, we didn't, we didn't know anybody like everybody wanted all the clubs wanted a a press pack and a demo. And like, we, we just didn't have means of recording a a proper demo. And, you know, this is the day before home recording. And I mean, we had a four track machine and and stuff, but it was just like, we didn't know what was going on. And and we weren't, there was no metal scene in Ventura County at all. And so it wasn't until we got into high school that we ended up just, we always played with punk bands and hardcore bands and we, they would write about us in a lot of fanzines and just basically say, Hey, these guys are respected for their musicianship and they're not afraid to play a Metallica cover too. If you ask them, basically, I mean, that's kind of what we were. We were just covering a lot of metal songs. We had original songs, but, but not many. And we were just learning how to get better. 
but we always just wanted to play gigs. And I remember like in the first few years of the band, I mean, I think we played like three or four times a year, you know, we, we'd end up just going to our guitar player's backyard and inviting yeah. anybody just saying, Hey, you want to come out on Sunday afternoon? And we would just have four friends or something, you know, it was, it was so, so rough. It was one of those moments where like when you're older, you want to be young again, but when you're young, it's like, you just want to be older. You want to be able, you don't want to be fucked with. You want to be able to go to clubs. You want to be able to go to concerts. You want to have a car. You want to have money. You want to be able to do what you want to do. And you want to be a part of the scene. And when you're young, it's just, you're constantly fighting to be involved in, in that stuff, you know? So. Interesting. Now, can you kind of walk me through your first show and kind of the, the, the feeling that you got from it? Because I, I, almost equivalent this to like hearing music for the first time and it's kind of like you'll never get that back again so i'm just kind of curious your first show and what that did for you in terms of spiritually or mentally or so, whatever you were kind of going through at, at that point in your life yeah like i remember being extremely nervous and th this this lasted for like the first four years of my career where like i would go on stage and my hands would be so clammy and so sweaty. And I would realize that like performing live in front of people is it's, it's, it's a whole nother world than rehearsing even in front of people in your rehearsal space. Like I would just, I would make so many mistakes live and like, I, I just didn't have the dexterity anymore or the coordination. I was thinking about all these other things around me. I was trying to sing too while play, which is something that takes years to get good at. And I was a terrible singer. I was more focused on, on the guitar playing. And even at that, it was just, it was just frustrating. Things would go wrong at every gig, you know, and it would just deflate me. Like I would have a hard time recovering. Like when something went wrong during a gig, I would have a hard time recovering nowadays. I can almost guarantee something's going to go wrong at every gig, but I recovered very quickly. And, you know, I learned that like, it's all about how you come out and how you finish, you know, everything in between, like anything could happen, you know, but like at that time I was just learning and it was like, my parents would have to drive me to gigs and they would be sitting in the back and I'd be embarrassed to play in front of them. Like, or I'd just be embarrassed to have them there because all the other kids and the other punk bands, you know, who come to find out parents didn't give a shit about them. You know, they weren't there, but I would just be like, yeah, my parents are here. And I kind of treated my parents kind of shitty at that time. I, I regret that, you know, because I, I, uh, I was just a young adolescent, you know, and, and I was dealing with a lot of social anxiety and social pressure. And I just wanted to be cool, you know, and, and having your parents around wasn't cool, you know, and, and, you know, looking back on it, like it was, it was just amazing to have, um, you know, to have parents like that, that, that supported me, you know, and, uh, they, they really, they really did. Sorry, I'm getting like a little emotional about it, but, uh, um, it's all good, man. Yeah, my parents, yeah, my parents were the same way. So it's all good, man. They always supported us and it's, it's crucial. Oh, it's almost crucial during this point, I would say, because, you know, especially if you're like a teenager, and I mean, you almost can't drive yourself to the gigs. You almost can't carry your equipment. So it's almost imperative that you have an outside source for these things. Absolutely. 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 I mean, it's, it's imperative. It wasn't until we got like a second guitar player who was like older where my parents started giving me a little bit more length on that leash. And he kind of like helped us out with stuff like that, you know, but, uh, but again, like his parents didn't give a shit about him and like, I didn't realize that till years later, looking back, going like, man, like what it, like how, how fortunate was I to have that? You know, if I could do it over again, I, I totally would. I'd do it in a different way and I would have more confidence with them in the room, you know? Um, but yeah, it was just, man, there's such a learning curve to playing live and, and I think I just, I cared so much about what we were doing. It was like my number one goal in life and it was my dream. And here I was supposed to be living it, living at that dream out. But I was just in the early years, I just wasn't confident enough in what I was doing when I was doing it, but I, I did have the courage to go out and try, you know? So, so that, that was one thing that, that, that got me through, but man, every gig, 
you know, there's gigs with Night Demon where I leave the stage and I look at the guys and we like hug each other or like high five each other because we know what just happened. Like we know something special just happened. In those days, we would get off stage and be like, practice tomorrow <laughs> at, at, at 3 p.m. And we're not leaving that room until, you know, like it, it was a, like we, we knew we knew we had our work cut out for us. You know, after every gig, we were like, man, this is not cutting it, you know. Can, can I ask you uh, uh, about your parents and whatnot and, and just kind of, you know, how have they seen you since then with the Night Demon? Uh, yeah. Band? And, okay. Okay. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it's now it's great. Now I love when they show up and now I'm trying to get them to gigs. You know? So, <laughs> uh, no, it's totally cool. It's totally cool now. I mean, it's it's to it's totally good. And through the years, you know, they, they've supported with a lot of other projects I've done. And, stuff. and, and I'm just kind of curious with Black Opal, who were you kind of trying to sound like at first being a singer for the first time and, and playing live gigs for the first time? I tried to sound like Metallica, basically, or Iron Maiden. I know those are two contrasting things, but I mean, like. As a young kid, you, your your voice isn't developed, you know, and it, it, you want to be rough and gruff and you can't do it. Or I couldn't, you know, and uh, I remember one of the first gigs we played, um, the local paper, the Ventura County Reporter, wrote an article about the gig. And uh, they talked about how good of a guitar player I was, but how my vocals were, were extremely shitty. And uh, I remember taking out an ad in the Recycler, which was a uh, like a free newspaper that you know where you could find musicians and you could sell gear and stuff. We would pick that up every week. Um, and I put out an ad saying like, you know, heavy metal band looking for the next Bruce Dickinson influences like Metallica, Maiden, Ozzy. Um, but nobody wanted to play with us. We were just too young, and and no other young people were. You know, metal wasn't metal wasn't fashionable, and. Um, especially the heavy metal we were doing. Um, but I, it, it deflated me for a while, but when we couldn't find a singer and I, I kept reading that article over and over again, I still have it. Um, it motivated me to get better. And so I started to take singing lessons from this old lady down the street who was giving piano lessons. And, um, I kind of started to develop a little bit more then, and then my balls dropped and my voice got a little more mature, you know? So, but I still take lessons to this day. Um, I studied with, with dozens of vocal teachers. I'm always trying to get better. I'm practicing and I'm always just trying to pick up new techniques. And I just kind of figure, uh, and from Night Demon, from album to album, I, I can hear the progression even at my age now. So I think that once you, once you've, think that you know everything is when you really kind of like is when your musical journey kind of ends you know you can, it's kind of when you start repeating yourself you know so I always want to just keep getting better and uh, it's I'm glad in hindsight that that I was I was dragged through the dirt publicly I was it was warranted I deserved it you know and it, it just made me stronger for it you know and I, I didn't it didn't make me quit you know well, and the beauty part about your career is you've always done something different with each of these projects, I know. So I'm just kind of curious, when was the first time that you kind of stepped in a recording studio or recorded even in your garage and, and walk me through that whole experience for you? Yeah, so like with Black Opal, we were doing kind of like, uh, like you know, just a, a, a tape recorder in the garage kind of thing that sounded like shit just to hear how we sounded. And then our drummers, our drummer's dad had known a guy who had, who was like a recording engineer and he came into our garage and brought this whole recording set up. We thought it was amazing, but you know, it was, all it was was a two track stereo, two track DAT recorder. So, I mean, you, we had to do everything live and we didn't have headphones. So, I couldn't hear myself sing or anything and I was singing into a microphone and when we heard it back, we were like, Oh my God, like, like, and our drummer had gotten a double bass pedal for the first time. Like he got it that day, like for the recording <laughs> and never, so he was all over the fucking place, you know, but, but it was a, uh, it was a cool experience. Um, but that was like, okay. And again, it's like, we got to get better. You got to get better as a live band and ready to, to be recorded, you know? So that was my first experience with that. And we did various demos. You know, we started to, we really, at that point, we really started, um, I upgraded and got, uh, an eight track 
cassette recorder and we started to kind of learn how to record on our own we never got good at it but uh we it was it was good it was good to it was i learned that it was it was better recording ourselves and hearing ourselves back because we we always had a lot to learn from that when you kind of just play with each other you're not really hearing everything and and you think you sound a lot better than you do you know so it's always good to record i always give that advice to musicians record yourself all the time and listen back it's tough sometimes to hear yourself especially to hear your own voice but at least you know how it sounds and you know what to to improve on what and were you kind of passing these demos around and gaining more of a following more friends no. getting okay okay so these we are never, just for we you never, guys yeah we never released anything as that band to this day we haven't um uh, I've got a ton of stuff that I'm sitting on, but it's like, we never thought it was good enough. We never thought we were good enough. So people just kind of knew us as a local band. And some people knew some of our, our really good friends knew the original songs. Nobody else did, but we would play a shit ton of covers all the time. So like, it was, it was fine, you know? And, and we were, we were always striving to get to that point. And then the band eventually broke up when the, our bass player, Doug Clark died in a car accident. So oh, no. um, I'm sorry to yeah. hear, man. Yeah. So that we were 18 years old when, when that happened. And, and, um, I took a break, a little, a a break for a a year or two from playing and, um, was promoting concerts and touring with bands as a tour manager and and a guitar tech uh, around those times. But it was good for me because I got to get out of town and have my first experiences going on the road and, and traveling the country. And, um, just just get to see what that life was all about you know when i was young so so who were the some of the first bands you were tour managing and how do you even get into this specific field in the music industry do you just go, go hop in a van and say i'm your guys <laughs> manager, and then just make well, a bunch of phone calls or well so what happened was when i was in high school i would i knew that nobody was gonna help the band was going to help my band, but us like, like there was, you know, we had tried to get a a manager or whatever, but again, like we weren't, we weren't that great. And we weren't like, we didn't have anything on record. We weren't putting records out. And, and uh, so I knew that I had to to work a lot um, myself on getting things going. So I would, I was constantly promoting our gigs and I ended up getting us some support slots at like uh, the whiskey in LA and uh, the Ventura theater and Ventura lab, like Hannibal corpse, six feet under skin lab. I remember uh, just kind of like bigger bands, like not even the metal we were playing, but they were just metal shows. And so I started to, um, I started to promote more shows at bigger venues and just promote other shows that my band wasn't even on. And so I started to get really heavily into the concert industry. And in Ventura, I was bringing in a lot of bands from overseas. I, I had made some friends at some some record labels. And um, I had this like college fund that my grandparents started for me. And I, I didn't go to college. So I, was, I wasn't planning on it. So I kind of took that money and was like putting on shows and helped bring some bands over from Europe <clears throat> at the time that hadn't come over yet. Um, And I was just putting on big shows. And before you knew it, like I kind of had this name in the concert industry where I would start getting offered like crazy shit, like warm up shows. Like I did like a Slayer show in Ventura and like uh, um, big bands like uh, No Doubt, um, you know, stuff like this. Like they would do big tours and be like, hey, we need a warm up gig first, you know, and I'd be like, oh, fuck. Like, um, yeah, I was doing a lot of stuff. uh, King Diamond, Merciful Fate wasp um a lot of punk stuff dri the dickies the damned bad brains um god the list goes on and on i was doing a lot of hair metal stuff quiet riot uh cinderella um all kinds of stuff man but uh um and i was just i was 17 years old so like i would lie have to lie about my age a lot to sign contracts and I would get into all these other clubs because people thought I was just an older guy because I was just doing all this stuff. Um, So through that, um, my senior year of high school, I was working so much and I was, I was at concerts every night. Most of them I'd be putting on. So I would like, 
you know, I would get to bed at like 4 a.m. and show up to school like extremely tired. And I just kind of checked out and I was flunking out of school. So I was like, fuck this. So I just I dropped out and I uh, just went full on into the concert business. And um, there was another band at my high school, a punk band called No Motive. And they had like they had gotten signed to this label, Vagrant Records, which was the manager of Face to Face. It was his label. It was an indie label. And they were just starting out. And they had kind of had like a real record deal. And the, the Trevor Keith from Face to Face produced their first album. And he, they were, he was going to take them on tour. And I was like, oh, this is incredible. So like they had done a tour with Good Riddance. And then they were going to do this Face to Face tour. And like the guys in the band were saying that they had this agent that was like kind of helping them out. But like they were having some trouble on the road, like they wouldn't have any a catering writer or anything. Or so I started making like kind of fake contracts and use this name Black Opal Management. And I would just copy like catering writers from like big bands that I was booking. And I would at the time it was fax. I would fax these to the promoters that they were and when they were on tour supporting these other bands and like half the time they would get the stuff so like um at, at one point um it was the summer of 99 they had asked me like hey why don't you come out with us and tour manage and you can guitar tech too because you know about guitars and and i was like yeah man that that that'd be fucking great so so that was my first experience it was going out with them and I would I would just do all the jobs. I was doing lighting for the band. I would take a whole roll of f it was film at the time. I was like doing photography and like I was doing lights while taking pictures of the band. I would like if they broke a string, I would run up there and change the string. I would drive. Um, you name it. You know, I just wanted to be involved, um, and that's that's how I got my start with that. But I toured with them for for a couple of years, and and. I was still promoting shows from the road and then I came back home and was promoting and then I just started playing in other bands again. Now I've always heard a rumor and you can hopefully put it to rest or see if it's true and whatnot that you had managed Dick Dale around this particular point or, or no, is... I, no, I was, I was Dick Dale's guitar tech. Gotcha. So, so how does so... that whole thing come in? Did you book him one night and then, and then, Funny enough is I did book Dick Dale when I was 19 years old and uh, he was kind of an asshole like when the show was going down and um, I remember that he was like a pilot so he would fly his own plane to the gigs and shit and he he had like a when you're when you're a when you have a private plane and you're coming into like commuter airports, you basically, you have a scheduled window like of time where you're allowed to fly. What You have to kind of schedule it and book it with them. It's not like you just show up and go, I'm out of here. You know, like there's, there's, I guess there's rules to these things. But I remember that um, I was supposed to pick him up from the hotel the day after the gig and take him and his manager to the airport which was like 15 minutes from my house. Like, so he could get in his plane and fly back home basically. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there was no cell phones at the time. And, um, uh, uh, <laughs> I was just young. And I remember I got like plastered the night after the show or the night of the show. And I had smoked like a copious amount of weed that had just like knocked me the fuck out. And I woke up, I think I woke up at like noon or something the next day and on my answering machine, there was like 10 angry messages from him. <laughs> like, I, I think I got to take him there at 8am or something. So I think he, he missed his flight window or something. But anyway, fast forward years later, a good friend of mine, Sam Bole was the bass player for Dick Dale. And um, he was also the bass player for agent orange. And he, I was I was working at a job and he had he had said, Hey, Agent Orange needs a bass player to go tour Europe. Uh, I want you to do the gig. And I was like, That's amazing. When? And he's like, Tomorrow. And I was like, Fuck, <laughs> I can't. I couldn't do it. You know, looking back now, I would have done it. I should have done it, but I didn't do it. Um but like a month later, the thing came up, says, Hey, Dick's gonna go to Europe, and he hasn't been to Europe in a long fucking time. He's gonna do five weeks out there and he needs a tech. 
And of course I'll be there. So we'll, we could have a lot of fun. Do you want to do it? And I said, yes, when is it? And he's like six months from now. It's like, okay, cool. I can plan for that. So that's how that whole thing started. So I started uh, being, I was Dick Dale's guitar tech um, for Europe. And in the States, his guitar tech was Armand, who is now the guitar player for, for, for 19. And so um, that's the gist of, of how I got that gig. Now, what did Dick teach you the most, either positively or negatively, that you still apply to this day? And and either I don't know how you talk to people or or business practices wise. What did he teach you the most that you learned from? Yeah, I mean, he. Uh, I hate to drag somebody through the dirt that's no longer with us. You know, he passed away a couple of years ago, so he's not really here to defend himself. But I didn't really care much for him as a human being. Um, uh, he, he wasn't, he wasn't the, the, the best guy. I mean, he's one of those guys that I see this with a lot of people. Well, not a lot of people, but there are some people I know in the industry that like, they're extremely nice on the surface to their fans and they're, and they're really, really good people to the, to those people, but to the people that are closest to them, they're just, they're just they don't really take care of him very well, you know? Um, and with Dick, I think that he, he's just a very egocentric person that, that had, um, he just loved to talk about himself. He, I, he could talk for hours without you getting a word in. He'll repeat stories as if he hasn't told them to you before. I mean, to me, that's just the kind of sign of disrespect or that he doesn't really care. Um, you know, but he grew up in the showbiz era um, you know, I think he had some issues with his own father. Um, and he, you know, he was a very famous guy at a very young age, you know, and had a lot of people, a lot of yes men surrounding him all the time, you know, so that could, that could be a good reason for that. Um, but he, so through that, I learned, you know, to, 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 to really, you know, I mean, people, all my fans know me as a very fan friendly person. You know, I, I'd give the shirt off my back to them, but I want to make sure that I do that for the people that I, that surround me, you know, and being in a band, you spend so much time with people. Um, it's easy to get into a, a situation where oh, I don't like this guy because of this or whatever, but nobody's perfect, you know? And like it, like you, when you spend every waking moment with somebody for a decade, like, you just have to respect them as human beings and know that you've got the same faults, you know, and, and you got to, you got to work it out. You got to live together and just realize that imperfection is, is a thing that that's, that's uh, defines all of us. And, and we need to have mutual respect for each other. So with my dealings with him, I learned that, but as far as professionalism, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, like, he he i mentioned it before he said it's all about how you come out and how you finish he's actually a guy the guy that told me that um uh but he, i remember one time too i asked him i'm like dick we need to get a backdrop man we, we can make a really cool backdrop for the stage like you know you, you never have anything you just kind of walk out on stage and do your thing and he's like they fucking know who they're here to see <laughs> yeah you know? it's like it's like oh good point you know good point but uh, I think with heavy metal, it's a bit different. Like we're all about imagery. So having a backdrop is, is a good thing, you know. Um, but yeah, I really just, it's funny because a lot of people consider him the godfather of heavy metal. Not a lot of people in heavy metal do, but they don't know. But I, if one thing I could pass on from Dick's legacy is that in, in the 50s, he and Leo Fender together invented the 100 watt amplifier because every amp at that time, I and mean, he was playing these these big halls and his shit wasn't loud enough. People couldn't hear it, you know? He was also playing like gauge 58 strings, okay? Like 13 to 58, like, and he created like a heavier, loud rock and roll sound. And that, if that really kickstarted the era of rock and roll as a loud concert, a loud, aggressive, style and speed picking and stuff that was all him you know so i do give the old man credit for for those kinds of things i just think on a personal level you know 
he really like gave me like a lot of PTSD. I mean, there's <laughs> story, there's there's a lot of stories that I that I just I can't t- talk about sure. publicly. Sure, but some pretty some pretty horrific things, man. And that, uh, but again, look, hey, he he. He, I'm sure, is a product of his environment. I'm not. I'm not letting him off the hook, but I'm also not here to um, to to discredit anything that the man's done. You know, so I agree. I always kind of maintain that like thrash metal came from surf rock and Dick Dale and whatnot. So because if you listen back to it, it's pretty fucking heavy. For especially yeah. in nineteen what fifties, ni- early nineteen sixties, like this like, is. I think like I think like fifty seven was when he, he okay. really he really came out, you know. So like so. pre pre Beatles almost, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's, oh, like, oh yeah, oh yeah. no no for for sure. Like Dick Dick was a big influence on a, on a lot of people. If you if you listen to the Hendrix song, uh, Third Stone from the Sun," mm-hmm. he says you'll never hear surf music again, and that was because at the time. Uh, Dick had had cancer, and everybody thought he was going to die. But he actually he made it out through that. But that's that was a reference to that, you know. So even even Jimmy was uh, was uh, singing his praises, you know. So. Well, and you can almost, I mean, even the guitar tone and whatnot too, from from people like Dick Dale, the Lively Ones, the Ventures, all this stuff, yeah. hugely influenced bands like the Doors. I'm assuming and Hendrix, right? So it's Zeppelin, like yeah, Cream, um, mm-hmm. bands of this. So it's it, it all comes from somewhere. And I always k- gave credit to the surf rock just because maybe I like it a little bit more than most people. That's but amazing. I love surf music. I yeah. love surf music. Right. So, but I guess, you know, moving, moving on from this or whatever, when I, I got to know the origins. And again, if you, you can discuss however much you want on this, but I'm just kind of curious where the name Jarvis Leatherby comes from. Yeah. So um, when we started night demon in 2011, I had already had, I had already been in a few successful bands and I actually had a solo career under my, my birth given name and it was widely popular and I had toured the world with this. And so Night Demon was never a serious band to begin with. Like we, it was just three friends that loved the new wave of British heavy metal and we wanted to make a four song EP just for fun, just for us. And that's it. We never thought there. Yeah, there it is. Uh, we never thought we never thought that anybody would would care about this. You know, I had I had lived through the '90s playing heavy metal and nobody cared. Um, in the 2000s, metal got very aggressive, and the stuff I liked was even less popular believe it or not. Like uh, I remember when I was promoting shows, like I would bring, I brought King Diamond to Ventura twice and there was a hundred people there both times. Uh, the same month I did Fear Factory and I did a thousand people, you know? And like the, if you played a guitar solo, you were dead. Like it was dead, like your old man rock, right? So uh, I, when we had started Night Demon a decade later, it was like, we were just, we didn't know about the internet subculture. We didn't know about the Euro festivals or anything like this 10 years ago. Like we just didn't know, like we, it wasn't a part of our lives. We didn't know about the LA metal scene. Uh, Brent, our guitar player kind of knew a bit, but but we just had no idea that anybody cared about this stuff. And so our intention was to do it for ourselves. Now. When we recorded the EP, we were a band for five weeks. We got together once a week and we were, every time we got together, we wrote one of those songs. And on the fifth rehearsal, it's the recording that you hear. So it's basically a glorified demo. Um, And when it got time to put it out, um, Brent had an idea that it would be funny if like we all had these like old school British names. And so like the idea, the idea was to put out a seven inch and have people think that it was a band from like 1981 or something that nobody had ever heard. And we actually tried to, that was our goal. We tried to do that. Um, and we did fool a couple people, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but so he gave me the name Jarvis Leatherby. And he gave his himself the name Ogden Aldrich the Third, and I think that the drummer Pat Bailey, I think his name, I, I, I always forget, but I, 
I seem to remember we just called him like Thud, <laughs> you know, because like kind of in a homage to Thunderstick from Samson, but like a just a drummer, Jay's a drummer, caveman drummer, right? But when when it came time for the the record to be released and people were really excited about it because they had heard a digital version and they, you know, we had done a couple shows here and there. They'd seen the band live. I think those guys really wanted their real name on it because they were like really proud of, of what we were doing. For me, I had just already had a career, a solo career under my own name. I didn't want to confuse anybody. So I just rolled along with it. And it, it 10 years later, like if you call me by my, birth given name I, I, it would be hard for me to answer like it, it's just it's just it just caught on and it became like a thing it was a total joke with between me and my friends for a long time and we would fucking joke about it all the time but then it just became a thing and now it's just like my my identity so you know. it's almost it's almost one of the reasons why night demon to me is like so successful because jarvis isn't really like a, a name used a heck of a lot in in metal period, you know, like I only know one Jarvis and that's you, you know, yeah. it's like, it's, it's, it's almost given you some sort of clout too. And, and, and you obviously deserve that clout where it's like, I, I don't know. I just, it just fits so well with the night in the night demon camp, right? Sure. With the name Jarvis leather. It's just so cool. So anyway, move, moving forward. So why start a heavy metal band in the, the, the tens? Obviously this came out right after the new wave of thrash metal scene. We can't forget that too. Cause you had sure. metal core and then the thrash scene in LA and whatnot. So then it kind of shifted into this traditional heavy metal thing. And I'm just, you know, I just kind of was curious where that came from for you. And you started it kind of almost so late in your career because maybe you were successful in this area here. So you wanted to be mm -hmm. successful in the, the traditional heavy metal thing. Well, again, it, there was no seriousness behind it whatsoever. It was like the, the CD that you're holding up came out two years after that was recorded. So nobody had heard the band really until 2013, you know. Uh, we're still a fairly new band, I, I suppose, you know, I mean, we've done a lot in our time, but, uh, um, you know, when you talk about the evolution of metal, like I got away from it in the early 2000s and in the, 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 the mid 2000s, because it just lost all its musicianship. It got, it I started to add too many elements of rap and like just bad fashion in my mind. Um, and you had this movement come out dubbed the new wave of American heavy metal, which had a lot of bands in it that I was like, this isn't fucking heavy metal. Like this is, I guess it's a subgenre of metal, but like, dude, this is not, this is, this is a bad representation of what that, what that acronym is, you know? And, and I, I, I just didn't identify with it. No disrespect to any of the bands that were involved in that. But um, I think like once MySpace, MySpace was big for those bands. It was huge. And then, it, and then it went away and all those bands lost all those fans. They didn't, they didn't lose them all, but like, it's really hard to, to take people somewhere else, you know? So um, I think when that happened, it opened up a lot more doors for people trying to do a more traditional sound. And that's when like the, 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 the next gen thrash bands came around, you know, bands like, uh, like Warbringer. I mean, just talking about bands that I, that I kind of had heard about in my area, you know? Um, and then you had some traditional metal bands like in Midnight Chaser, Enforcer, White Wizard. High Spirits, White Wizard, um, Cauldron, you know, bands like this that we started to get turned on to. So we're kind of like, hey, man, there is a there is a kind of scene for this. But we didn't know this till after we, we became Night Demons. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, it wasn't our intention to join any kind of scene, you know? And like, if you look back on it, <clears throat> I'm not going to say we were the first ones to do it because the bands I mentioned just right now were doing it before us, but we just didn't know, we had no knowledge they existed, but we all connected together through the internet. And, um, you know, we've definitely become one of the more recognizable faces in that scene, just probably due to, to the work that we've done, you know, um, and our dedication to making it 
the number one thing in our in our lives and our dedication to taking it around the world many times to people that that enjoy this stuff. Now, I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, you literally released this four song, you know, uh, EP demo, whatever you guys want to call it, and literally hopped in a van and toured for fucking months and months and months with bands like Raven and um, bands of that kind of statue. So you guys, obviously, you had the connections that, that you know, with the probably with the concert promoting. And, no, no, and, no. No, okay. So did you no. just establish this? We had we had no connections. We knew nobody. Like my concert promoting days were long gone by a decade. And I was playing my solo stuff. I was doing like, like fifties rock, soul music and surf music. Like I was in a totally different scene completely. I didn't know there was a heavy metal scene anymore besides the big mainstream artists. So we had to meet everybody for the first time. Like we, we knew nobody. The reason we got on tour with Raven is because we begged the promoter to play with them Diamond Head when they came through town. We begged all the promoters. We found the agent's email address online and bugged the shit out of him. We were just punishers. We just bothered everybody. We got in everywhere we could. Then we would meet the bands and talk to them. And they would say, hey, you guys are pretty good. And I'd say, like, hey, you want to do a tour? And, like, if you ask, sometimes you get, you know. But, no, we had we had no connections. I, I, I want to make that clear. And I don't want anybody to think that we, you know, the whole it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's both, you know. And, like, you have to get to know people when you don't know anybody. When you have no connections, make the connection. That's how we met. You know, we were playing gigs together, and you were out at every show, and I was out at every show, and we just became friends, right? So, like, that's how that, that kind of stuff happens, it's it's you, you have to and when there is where there is no scene you create it you know and we felt like we've done that in other towns that we've traveled to a lot as well so um yeah it's 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 you're never you're never stuck these days about not knowing anybody you could easily meet people now it's very easy even the ones that you once look up looked up to or whatever in your early days because i've found a lot of people that like i'm like oh shit it's it's kind of almost strange to like be meeting that said person and whatnot or even doing an interview with that said person and it's just like so cool to see like that we're all still like human beings at the end of the day and not this like glorified rock stars all of us so especially with you i mean you're you're just as 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 humbled and it's the same person that i met what 10 years ago at this point that you are, hey, you know, dude, we're, today, we're both still so. wearing, we're both still wearing flannel, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, no, I mean, nothing's like, changed, they, dude. Nothing's yeah, they changed. Say, yeah. They say don't meet your heroes, but you should, I mean, you should. And yes, they will. Will they disappoint you on any given day? Sure. I mean, you know, sure. But like, it's good to know that everybody is a human being so that, you know, you, it's, it's, it gives you the courage to pursue your own career, you know, because you're like, Hey, wait a minute, this guy's just like me, you know, or, Hey, this guy's an asshole. And I want to, I want to do what he's doing, but be a nice guy. If an asshole can do it, then, a, then a good guy can do it, you know? So, uh, <clears throat> I think that it's, it's, it's really, yeah. But yes, look, I have those pinch me moments all the time where I'm like, sometimes I look through my emails or like just my, I scroll through my last, my last 20 text messages and I'm like, this is my life. Like, <laughs> like 20 years ago, I w never thought I'd be talking to these people, you know? So it's a, it's a, it's a good, it's life. Life is good, man. It's a, it's a good thing to experience. And I highly suggest that everybody just follows their passion, whatever that might be. You know, if you're obsessed about something, like you got to just stay in it. Like you'll, you'll make it. You know, you'll make it somewhere or another. It's, I think it's just about consistency. If we're going to be completely honest, just doing it consistently sure. and, and whatnot. So um, anyway, let's, let's, let's get on, on track real quick. I want to talk about the, the curse of the damned record for you, mm -hmm. recording it for the first time. And essentially the, the response to this, cause this is, I think this came out on steam hammer, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so and, I don't know how that and century media. Yeah. Okay. So walk yeah. me through even just getting to this specific stage in your career in 2015. Yeah. So we had just been playing regional shows and we hadn't done 
we hadn't really done any touring yet. And in 2014, we got a chance to play three festivals in Europe, but they were spaced out like seven weeks. You know, it was like between the three of them, there's like seven weeks of ground to cover. And we couldn't afford to, to go back and forth. You know, we were hardly getting paid any money and we, but we, we really saw this as a great experience. So, um, we had written the songs for that record, but the EP was the only thing that was released. So we had High Roller in Germany release a uh, expanded edition of that EP that had some bonus tracks, like just cover songs that we'd done. And so we went to Europe, we quit our jobs and said, let's do this. We're going full time. If we're homeless, whatever. And we were homeless for a long time, but uh, we just got on the internet and hit up as many promoters and as many clubs as we could in Europe to just fill the gaps in between and just say, hey, we'll play for food and a place to sleep. And if we could sell merch, that would be great. And so we ended up doing a full tour in Europe with just this EP out. And we, we, we got the attention of a lot of people, and uh, especially on these festivals. So the deal with Steam Hammer came up. We met, we reconnected with Raven at a festival. So, so, so see, we had played with Raven and Diamond Head in 2013 in the fall in LA, Orange County and Vegas. And we kind of become friends with those guys, but not really to the point we didn't exchange phone numbers or anything yet. And we just met them and told them how much we loved them and they liked what we were doing. So we were playing at a festival in Spain that we had begged to get on in that in that spring of 20 spring early summer 20 2014 and raven was the headliner at the end of the night it ended up we it was us and raven in a dressing room <clears throat> excuse me and all the shuttles that were going back to the hotel were gone and they had stopped running and so we were kind of stuck back there just the two bands and we were just shooting the shit and that's when the whole idea for the tour came up to happen so we had kind of said okay let's put a tour together no booking agent we'll just do it ourselves i put my contacts together with theirs and we had kind of just started doing this so we had gotten the offer from steam hammer to do a full-length record and then we had um had an offer from century media that we were still kind of working on they wanted um they really wanted to own the publishing and it was something that we didn't want to give up and it would cause a lot of back and forth between the two of us because of that. But in the end, we, we ended up getting what we wanted and taking a much lower advance, but I'm grateful that we did that. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, but for the curse of the damn record, we had already had most of it recorded and it was actually called run for your life. Um, we had not written the songs, um, screams in the night or mastermind yet. So it was a nine song record. <clears throat> Actually, it was a 10-song record. We re-recorded the, the song The Chalice from the EP. And um, so we had had a meeting that summer with Steam Hammer, and we had said, okay, well, yeah, we want to do this deal with you. Here's the album. It's actually done. And they listened to it, and they said, um, it's really good. The songs are great, but it doesn't sound like Night Demon. Like, it just doesn't have the energy. And they were right. Like, we, we had tried to get super professional on this record, and we had, like layered a bunch of tracks on it and we had recorded everything to a click which we had never which we did not do on the ep so we went back that summer and re-recorded the album in three days to no click track and just kept it raw um very minimal overdubs and kept it three-piece sounding i suppose and handed it back in and they're like that's it that's the night demon sound you know so that's what you hear on that record um one day we'll release a deluxe version that will have that original album on there. It's, it's interesting to hear. It's actually, it's pretty cool, but, but this is definitely the correct representation of the band. So we ended up signing with Century Media later in the year. And in uh, January of 2015, that album came out on Steam Hammer in Europe and Century Media in the US and North America. So we had two labels working for the band. Uh, so you have two separate sides of publicity and promotion. And I think that did a lot to help us out and really get the word out for the band. Um, that album charted really well and it, it ended up selling, selling very well. And we hit the ground running and just toured our asses off that year and in 2016 on that record. And we, we won a lot of like uh, reader polls, which is nice because that comes from the fan. We, run, we won a lot of radio polls 
made a lot of year end lists and became, you know, it was the number one record in a lot of publications. And uh, it was just something that completely blew us away. And I think the road work that we did helped. And I think people bought really bought into the spirit of the band at that point. And they were like, okay, here's a band here's a band that's a band of the people, you know, and a band we can get behind, whether they're our favorite band or not yet, there's, there's, there's something special here. It's, it's headed in the right direction. And, and we, as the fans all feel a part of this. Do you think that has to do with your guys's integrity as people though? Cause I, I would assume that that's where, where we kind of click or whatever is, is that we kind of relate to that integrity and, and almost that humbleness that comes for you, for you guys as individuals. So we always want to support the underdogs and, and, and your band because of that, because that's, that's just speaking for me. That's where that, that's why yeah. I always root for night demon is that just cause I know you guys as people are very humble, very down to earth. It's like these guys, you know, let's root for them because they deserve it. You know? Yeah. I could see that in certain circles, but not everybody knows this as people. So I think that it comes from the live show. When people see the band live, they were they they've just they're not used to seeing that kind of intensity in this style. So I think they really get behind that, and they're like, "Well, you know what? At least these fucking guys mean it." You know, like whatever. If I like the music or not, I can respect it because when I watch the band play live, they're based. You know, there's there's sweat and blood sometimes and they're just like you could tell they're fucking worn out like they're giving it everything they have like it's their last day and i'll tell you man when you're homeless and you like there were days on that 2015 europe tour where we were we did like i think 65 shows in 90 days like we would have played every day if we could sometimes we just didn't have a gig and we were stuck somewhere but like there were times where we didn't eat for over a day and a half or something like you start feeling that, you know, and it just, <laughs> it really creates the, no pun intended, like the hunger, <laughs> you know, and to really like, you, you want to go out there and earn it. Even if there's 10 people there, it's like that. If I could get these 10 people to buy a t-shirt without saying, go buy a shirt, because that's something that we've never done. If we can get them to buy into what we're doing and create an experience for them like they've never had, you know, we're going to eat tonight and we're going to stay alive, literally, you know? And I was a, it was a, I'm grateful for us having the guts to put ourselves in, in a position like that because it, it created the best kind of art and performances out of us. I would, I would absolutely agree with that statement, especially for the years to come. It would just, you've just grown so much, even since then, since when I first saw it, kind of saw you guys. I'm, I'm just kind of curious. When was the point when, when Brett kind of decided to to take a leave, and and you guys obviously continued on without him. So I never knew kind of what happened with that whole thing. If, it, again, you could say as, as much or as little as you want with this particular subject. So. Yeah, I, I don't really, I, I don't want to speak for him, you know, so, and we've never, we've never, I mean, the band has a podcast that runs every week and we still, even covering the early days, like we've still never really spoken about or made, made a public statement about, you know, I don't really want to air out the band's dirty laundry right there, even though like we are pretty much an open book. Um, but that was at the beginning of 2016 that he exited the band. Um, and then we got Armand in on guitar, which like Armand's been a part of the band, a part of the story since the beginning. He was the engineer and producer on Curse of the Damned and the EP. Um, he had helped us with with a lot of those guitar parts solo wise, you know, on those records. And we actually asked him to join the band when we started, um, but he was involved in some other projects. But with Brett leaving the band, I mean, it sucked. You know, he and I were the founding members and. I, I mean, I really miss, I really miss having him around as a friend, you know, like that's what I miss the most. We were like brothers and we, we had a, we had so much in common, like musically, you know, um, <clears throat> but things change, you know, things change and situations and people's lives change. And we've all got to make decisions, you know, for the, for the, for what's best for, you know, with Night Demon, it was a thing where 
we always put the band first, you know, we put the collective before any of our, anything of, of us personally. These days, um, it's a, it's a little different. We're more of like a Metallica situation where it's like, I mean, I, well, we're nothing compared to them, but I, I, I'm just saying where we're like, I'm always kind of looking out for the guys in the band now first, like personally, like to make sure that they're happy in their personal lives and, and they're not getting burnt out and, and that they have everything that they need. And if I could help supply that for them, even if it keeps us on tour, you know, like I'm more than happy to sacrifice that and to do that for, for the individuals in the band, you know, um, at the time I wasn't like that, you know, with Brent, I was more like, like, no, we have to honor our commitments as a band. Like, this is the rule. This is the law. Like we, we abide by the code of honor that we had agreed on that this band comes first and, and nothing else does. And, and, and if we do this long enough, like you said, consistently enough, like we're, <clears throat> It's, it's like delayed gratification. It's like you, 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 you go through the pain now so that later on you have, you have a career that you can rest on and you, you have, you have a foundation where like, Hey, if I don't want to tour this year, I don't have to, we can go out next year and people will actually care about it, you know, because we, we put the work in, you know? So at the time, I think that, um, I was more on that side of the fence and I was not as, um, maybe, I understanding the understanding to, to his needs but i do think that maybe between us there was a communication breakdown where maybe you know from his end of it maybe those things were communicated as well as they should have been and i think things kind of built up for a while and instead of and and now i'm a lot more conscious about checking in with with the guys like on a more regular basis you know to see where where they're at so if i could do something about it now we can avoid problems in the future that may happen, you know? So, sure. Um, I mean, you guys have had a lot of road stories together to you and Brent. So that <laughs> must've been, you know, it must've kind of been a drag to the, to have to, you know, kind of move on from that thing. And I mean, and again, honestly, I, I, mm -hmm. I miss him. Like I miss him a lot as like, it, when we, when we started night demon, we, this is the strangest thing, but it's the truth. We started a brand new band and felt completely nostalgic about it from day one. Like it was like, like we, like we were, we were, we started the band when I was 30 years old, you know, it's like we, we were kids again. Like we, we, we had found the brotherhood and the bond that we had been wanting our whole lives with somebody else, you know, that we had not found that we, 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 we had the same vision and we wanted to play the same stuff. And we had to spend years of our lives playing in other bands and playing other styles of music to finally meet each other and come together. That's what I miss the most. Can you kind of, can we kind of back up a little bit and just walk me through when Dusty comes into the fold too, as you, like now, you yeah, know, you're yeah. For like 10 years at this point. So can't forget about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he, he, he and Armand were actually in a band together called new Liberty. They were kind of more like a guns and roses style band, I would say. Um, and uh, our drummer, Pat night demon had never really wanted to be in a band. I mean, uh, he, Again, he was under the impression that we were just going to record an EP and play one gig, and that was it. So he was never really in the band. Um, then we had our second drummer, John Criar, who was in uh, the band The Fucking Wrath with Brent Woodward. Um, so he came along and was kind of like a big torchbearer of us keeping the band going because he was like, look, I know you guys don't really want to be a band, but this stuff's really good. And I'll be the drummer if you need somebody. So we were kind of like, okay, that makes it easy. Um, he was way more of a punk drummer though. We wanted to experiment more on the more metal side of things. So that's when Dusty came in and he came in in the fall of 2013, recorded the Curse of the Dan album and has been our drummer ever since. So like he's he's the, the drummer of the key lineup of the band and you know he'll always be the drummer of this band. Yeah. Well, what about his and yours chemistry? Why does it work so well? What do you, why do you think that that is where you guys kind of came together? And have, I mean, that the chemistry, why, why do you think it, that works so well for you guys between? The I two think of you? that I think that's the fact that we have no rhythm guitar player, so to speak, in the band. It's a three piece band and it's like the bass and drums always have to be locked in. But at the same time, the bass in Night Demon is almost like a big guitar. It's not traditional 
subbed out bass sound that just kind of plays along. It's like, like Lemmy, dude. So <laughs> yeah, but, but it's like Lemmy meets Geezer Butler meets Steve Harris. Like I do a lot more than Lemmy does, you know. Um, no, t- I mean hey, I know. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> it is what it is, you know. I mean, like, like uh, there's a lot there's a lot more happening on the bass than a mo- in a, in a, than in a Motorhead song, you know. So. Um, that's no disrespect to Lemmy, okay? But uh, you know, I see him play the bass too, and you know, I do it well. And like he, he's he's definitely an influence, but he's just a very small part of of it, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's that's what it has to do. It's the fact that there's nothing to hide behind, you know, in this band. So we have to be locked in as a unit, and we've just we've played a lot together, you know. So. Um, I, we listen to each other a lot, you know, we're, we're not just kind of off in our own world. Interesting. Now let's, let's change subject just a little bit and just walk me through your reasonings for starting Frost and Fire Fest. You know, I think a lot of that has to do with my background in concert promotion. Um, I had been putting on a punk, a hardcore punk fest, um, in Ventura County, um, around the time that Night Demon started called Nard Fest, uh, based around the Nardcore scene, the Nardcore bands like uh, Ill Repute, Dr. No, False Confession, Aggression, Stalag 13, The Rotters, just the legendary punk bands from the area that we come from. And so when Night Demon started touring the world and playing festivals, even festivals in the States, we kind of looked around and thought, okay, like we've done all these now, what's cool about them and what's not cool about them. You know, we kind of thought like if we could take all the good elements from all these and make something here on the West coast, like there's nothing on the West coast like this. It's hard to believe there's nothing. So like, let's do this. And so we started it as a one day festival. We named it frost and fire in honor of Sierra Thungle, the only other heavy metal band from Ventura. We had those guys come and sign autographs at it. And it was a ploy to kind of get, it was it was basically like I said before, where there's no scene, you must create it. So, we created a metal scene in our town by bringing the rest of the world to our town, and we thought that Ventura on the beach was a great environment for people in the month of October, versus Sweden or Norway or Germany or New York. You know, like it was just a it was a it was the environment was what we were all about. Bring the bands and the fans to a great environment where they can enjoy themselves and have a bit of a vacation if you will you know and bring it to small intimate venues and that's how the whole thing kicked off in 2015 you know and it's got it's done a lot since then well and obviously there's been a dip in it you know obviously you, you there are a couple years now it hasn't been here and now it's back again so can you walk me through your reasonings your reasonings for at the time for you know kind of putting it on the back burner so to speak yeah well um you know, I've always been a person to trust my intuition. And when something feels wrong, it's because it is. Um, I think a lot of people do things out of an obligation and they quickly realize that that's not the right move for them. They do things because of social pressure or financial pressure as well. Um, for us, it was the fact that we would commit to this festival every year, a year in advance we would bankroll the festival with band money from night demon. You know, if we made any money, like we would still have to front thousands upon thousands of dollars to put this on. We'd have to front that money in advance, not knowing if it was going to be successful or not. And meanwhile, we're still pretty much borderline homeless. You know, Um, it was something that I felt was good for the scene but I didn't feel that we had to be martyrs for the scene either. You know, like we've since passed the torch to other people that have done a great job with it. Um, But, you know, the thing is like the band was having to sacrifice a lot too, because we would, things would come up where we'd get these fall tour offers that were huge for us, but we couldn't do it because we were obligated to put this festival on, you know? So we were like, at the end of the day, are we festival promoters or are we a band, you know? Um, uh we had gotten into 2018 and we were doing our fourth edition. We had done an edition in London that year too. So it's like, we were definitely spreading our wings. You know, we had done the sold out and sold out weekend in London. Um, and at that point I thought we had a pretty great lineup in for the West coast. And I didn't have an idea of who I wanted the next year. 
we were getting a lot of repeat bands and I was just uninspired by it at that point. And I, uh, I see a lot of other festivals that go, that do go consistently every year, but it's like, you're all, you, there's some of the years are just duds. And like, I didn't want to do that. Like if I'm not inspired by it, I'm not going to do it just to do it. Like to put a half hearted effort into it. Like it's just, it's, it's no good for anybody. So people, many people around the world regard it as their favorite festival and they still do. And it's for reasons like that, you know? So a lot of people thought I was crazy or foolish or stupid for stopping it when I did. Um, at the end of 2018, I decided to take a break from it and I was criticized a lot for it, but then the pandemic hit, you know, and look at all these promoters that lost their ass on that and, and had to go through this charade about postponing three or four times that never happened to us. It never happened once. So I'm glad that we trusted our instincts because it was the right move. You know, we would have had to cancel. I mean, look, you know, and the following year in October, we toured with Sacred Reich all through Europe, you know, like we, Nighting was able to take that opportunity and be on a tour bus and like play to a lot of new fans. And we, we continued our Hall our Halloween festival in Hamburg, Germany that we put on. So it's like, it's not like we stopped doing events. We just took a break when a break was needed. And then the world told us we were crazy. And then the, the world came back and said, you're not crazy because if you wanted to put it on, you can, you know? So, so here we are. We've had a break from it. We've had a chance to revisit it. We're putting on an edition in Ireland this this um, this summer called Frost and Fireland, um, <laughs> and we'll be bringing it back to the West Coast in, in a bigger way than you could ever imagine. So, um, yeah, I like it. I'm I'm looking forward to to seeing what what happens with that. Now, Armand comes into the fold here. Uh, he does a couple tours with you, I believe, at this point, and and slowly but surely you record and start to write for the Darkness Remains record, which is my personal favorite Night Demon album so far. Right? I can't say it is of all time because, uh, you know, you, yeah, nothing's been made since. Yeah, more <laughs> to come. Right? So, but um, walk me through how different this writing process was than, say, the Curse of the Dam record, and what at some of the elements you wanted to incorporate more into darkness remains well it wasn't too different because brent and i and dusty had had already written most of those songs we were right in the middle of writing that record when when he was no longer in the band so armand came in and we're like hey look here's these songs you know we're still kind of working them out so he just jumped right in and we started working them out together and it felt really good we worked a lot with him before and we had been friends for so long and he and I had played in a ton of bands together and he and Dusty were obviously in new Liberty together. So it fit right in right away. Um, but right after he was in the band, you know, we just started working on those songs for about a month. He played his first shows with us. We did, we opened for Satan in San Francisco and in LA. Then we went on the final curse tour where we played the curse of the dad album curse of the damned album from back to front that was a full u.s tour so that was his first tour and then we went we went to the studio recorded this record and then went right on tour with carcass and then went right to europe like there was never really a break so um but yeah uh the big difference i think is his playing on as on lead guitar that's a big noticeable uh difference and the fact that we did no rhythm track so it's just like it sounds like van halen one it's just it's the true three-piece action there it's the there when he goes for a solo it's just my massive bass tone behind it you know and it it translates well live because when i saw you guys i think it was like 2018 the what is it strike fest or something you guys played okay. in los angeles and it was it uh i couldn't believe the amount of the, the sound that came from just you three in general so i can almost feel the synergy with you three and just how big of a guitar a player that that Armand gives out to the crowd, like his guitar tone is massive, and then obviously the massive bass tone, and everything's just so massive in Night Demon, and just works so well. So with the Darkest Remains record, it's like it literally sounds like that record live. Yeah, thanks. I mean, that's the goal. Yeah, every band says we want to make a record that sounds like us live, you know, and that that was our closest attempt to it at that point you know and that was the goal so how do we get the right sounds how do we sound how we how we do live and how we do that and there's a couple tricks of how we did that that you know are uh night demon secret so 
<laughs> well, we can get it. We only can expose as much as we can expose here. On the show. But um, let me ask you just the response to the Darkness Remains record. And was it even bigger than um, Curse of the Dam? And big? And did it meet your expectations? <laughs> it, it far exceeded our expectations. It was much bigger than Curse of the Damned. And it's hard because with with Curse of the Damned, we had we had we had gone number one in so many places that you know we we were we we even told ourselves like there's only one way to go from number one and that's down you know but surprisingly we repeated those number one spots in the same publications and polls with darkness remains and we actually got some higher accolades with it and things that we never would have expected big time fan polls out of europe um and you know uh our, a poster in Metal Hammer, a poster in Death Forever. We got a Metal Hammer Award, you know. Um, and, and we got to we got a, a tour with Accept, you know, like uh, just a lot of things that we were kind of like, wow. Okay, now for sure it's gonna it's gonna it's it's gotta go down, you know. So I don't know. Um, it 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 far exceeded our our expectations, but again, I think. Man, we were just so hungry at the time, and we were we were really really working the live markets, and um, it really helped sell that record, you know. And I I love the album cover on it too. Let's be honest, I I've always just dig the the references you put in the album cover yeah. with the even you guys standing on top of the building. You obviously uh, put Curse of the Damned in with. There's the, a you know, lot the, of Easter eggs in there, and if a big fan would notice a lot of things in there. That's actually. It's a recreation of the facade of Ventura City Hall, which is a very historic building in our town. So we have a lot of backstory to our songs and to the band and to like the lore of the band. You know, we, we've always had our mascots in Eugene, the Axe Guy and, and Rocky, you know, our, our main mascot. And what, we've always wanted to be a band that had that kind of imagery and story. A lot of our favorite bands had mascots and stuff like that, but those mascots never had a backstory, you know? They're kind of just there. And I, I feel like we needed to create something more behind it, you know? So we, we try and incorporate that a lot into our, our artwork. Absolutely. Now, the next step after this, you guys released a year, not even, what, a year later? The, uh, the, the live darkness, it's a triple vinyl right I mean, yeah. this is the triple vinyl but i'm just kind of curious why cleveland why not another part of the the states or or europe or whatever what what makes cleveland so special for night demon yeah well um originally the thought was to record it in germany you know where we have probably most of our fans per capita you know uh but we really wanted to take this opportunity when the record company wanted to do a live record to be like, Hey, look, you know, the most interviews we were doing at the time, people would say, how does the, uh, you know, South American audience or the Mexican audience or the Canadian audience or the European audience or the Japanese audience or whatever compare to the States, like metal's dead in the States. And I would always have to explain to people like, it's not dead. It's, it's a large, large country and it's very spread out. And yes, it may not be uh, chart topping, but there's metalheads all over the U.S. And for us, we wanted to represent them here. So Cleveland had been a long, a long time like hot spot for Night Demon. Um, there was a guy by the name of Bill Peters who was on. Actually, he just celebrated his 40th anniversary on the air at 88.9 W or 88. Uh, sorry. Is it 88.7 WJCU uh, running a, a show called the Metal on Metal Show on, on the college radio station every Friday night for 40 years. And he had gotten the night team EP from a friend in Germany and had been playing us on the station for about a year. And we came through town on our first tour and all these people were there singing the words. And we we're like, what is going on here? So we quickly discovered that we had this this burgeoning fan base out of Cleveland, Ohio. And so we just kept coming back there more and more and more on every tour. And it just kept growing and growing. So we decided to do the live record there. They were doing their annual uh, holiday food drive to um, feed the homeless. And Bill Peters had put together an amazing support bill for us and had facilitated the ability to record the gig. So 
we advertised it ahead of time and a lot of fans flew in from all over to be a part of the live recording so it was a sold out show i think well, i don't know seven or eight hundred people um and we put placed mics everywhere in that venue to really get the feel of like you were at the concert and it just sounds massive um and i'm glad we did it and uh, yeah it's triple lp it's a 90 minute show and uh it's it's our it's our tribute to american metal and it's american metal represented on a night demon record that many people around the world listen to all the time and i just got to ask this dude i wouldn't be doing my job if i didn't ask it how much of this is actually real how none much of, of it, it no, no 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 none of it's really no, live it's all studio I'm magic <laughs> i'm joking i'm joking i would say probably 85 percent. okay okay yeah like we only had one shot at it most out most bands record over a, a whole tour or like they do multiple nights we had one shot you know so we recorded the we recorded the show at soundcheck and recorded the concert so we were able to like certain pots certain parts go like okay like mics went down during the show we'd be like okay let's take that take from soundcheck or something just in that spot where everything was the same you know so no, nothing moved you know so we we're able to do that and also like the screams in the night we had the guitar went out so we restarted that song and told the audience hey we're going to do this again obviously because we can't leave the song off the record but we talk about that a lot in our podcast we've done six episodes covering this album and it goes fully in depth so i recommend any fan that wants to know more about that live album to check that out um and uh, we do play the uh, fucked up version of Screams in the Night in the, in the podcast. And so it's pretty hilarious. But, you know, I'm honest about it, you know, and it's like, what are you going to do? You want to make a live record like you you got to you're not going to if if something technically goes wrong, you're not going to have that on the record. And so we 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 knew that there was potential for that to happen. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this interview, seems like every show I've ever played, something's happened. So, like, we were ready for it and we were able to do it. And correct me if I'm wrong too, but the last time we spoke, you mentioned that you were video recorded as well. So will we potentially see this on a video aspect? Yeah, potentially down the line, but um, like we have no plans for it in the immediate future. There was a lot of, you know, we, we, we didn't allow any phones in the place, any video recording or audio recording, not even photography. So um we really kept a tight lid on this thing because in this, in these days, you know, I mean that the, it was recorded in December, 2017. It came out of in August, 2018. If you would have allowed that, you would have had shit all over social media and YouTube. And like, it just, it's just not right for this. You know, it's like, we wanted to put out a live record. So, so to this day, no fans have any documentation of that show, but we set up eight to 10 cameras for that shoot. We had a ton of house photographers that we hired. Like we definitely captured it in full effect, you know. And has it has the mystique surrounding it too, which not a lot of bands could could do nowadays. Which sadly, because of it's the, so the social media, yeah. yeah. So, can you walk me through even just getting you into Sir Earth Ungle and how that whole thing came about for them to approach you about the bass position? Yeah, I mean, like, I've been trying to get that, I was trying to get that band together for about a decade before it actually happened. Um, a lot of people in Europe had tried and offered them a lot of money, and I just kind of took it upon myself, because I knew it was friends, and, and I just said, you know, I think I can make this happen. And everybody out there told me I was crazy, but I was persistent. Um, the Frost and Fire Festival helped a lot get that going, but basically, I had gotten the members back into the band slowly one at a time um and they had started just playing on night demons gear and like we had you know i was playing bass in the band brent was playing guitar in the band and then jimmy and greg came back so brent wasn't needed anymore and i tried to get the original bass player involved but he's just he lives far away and you know he's got his own thing going on and the the band wanted me to manage them which I did agree to. Um, and then they wanted me to just stay on as the bass player. So that's, it just naturally happened that way, you know, and it's much easier for me on stage to direct traffic with the band 
than being a manager on the side of the stage going, no, 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 no. You know, <laughs> while I'm playing, it's easier to kind of check in on everybody. You know, they've got, they've been a band for 50 years, but I've got a ton more live experience. So it's, it's, it's good for me to be up there. Now, what does Sir Thongo offer you that's different than, say, being in Night Demon? Because what are you dealing with that are different obstacles, I guess, with Sir Earth that you don't have to deal with with Night Demon as well? It's completely different. And, like, the thing is, Night Demon's on stage for every gig that Sir Thongo's ever played since they've reunited. Dusty's always behind the drum monitor. You can't see him. And Armand's on the side of the stage. Armand sets up all the guitars, all the amps, like... He's he's responsible for the way the band sounds, you know. Dusty sets up Rob's drums and helps him along throughout the show. Actually, during the show, you just don't see that. So, Night Demon is always on stage with Sirius Ungol, always. Um, it's it's with Night Demon. I'm more in my element of being a front man and guiding the show. With Sirius Ungol, I'm more in a managerial element and guiding the show that way, you know. Um, it's completely different. It's completely different. And you also, we can't mention this too. We can't forget to mention this too. You also filled in, I think for Jaguar for a few gigs you, with uh, the live uh, vocal yeah. duties, correct? So, yeah, I mean, you literally are like the king of now the, not only the, uh, the new wave of, of traditional metal, but or traditional heavy metal, but you know, even the new wave of British heavy metal and old school traditional heavy metal. So it's like, you found yeah. a niche in both aspects, kind of. Yeah, getting to sing for Jaguar, one of my favorite bands of all time, you know, I mean, it was, it was just it was incredible, you know. Um, I always admired guys like like Dave Grohl, you know, and I always kind of wanted to be a guy like that, where, like, I could write songs, I could front my own band, I could play multi-instruments to a degree, Um I could organize festivals. I could have a record label. I could uh, manage bands. I could help reform bands. I could play in other bands and like still kind of all be under the same umbrella of like the scene that I'm involved in and just to play an integral role in like making things happen, not just being in the scene, you know, not just, not just, getting the glory for it, but actually putting, putting the work in to, to make things happen where, where they just didn't exist. And I, th I think that's, that's my calling. That's, that's why, what I'm, that's why I'm here. I think we need, there's, I, 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 I absolutely agree with that statement. And I think there needs to be more of us, um, doing this right i've always ventured into like there needs to be more people actually doing work in the scene not just playing in a band so i think it's really crucial to what you're doing and and in even starting pot this the 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 podcast that you do obviously we're on this podcast as well so having other platforms outside of just playing in a band is just crucial to any community right that's what we're that's what we're all here for is the community of of metal and helping it grow to the next generation of of fans and whatnot would you agree with this? I, I would agree. And I would also agree that there's there's a lot of people in the scene that aren't in bands that play an integral role. And I think there's a lot of bands. <laughs> I hate, I don't know, I'm not going to say that certain band that bands shouldn't exist. But I mean, I always encourage people, if you want to be in a band, definitely do it. But don't do it just to be cool or to be part of the scene. If you're not meant to play music and you don't have an obsession for it, okay? Don't don't cheap out and, and, and do it for those reasons, you know, because you're bringing the quality of the art down. You can play a part in the scene in many ways, whether you're a painter or an illustrator or you you want to be a, a concert promoter or you want to have a record label and put out stuff. Even if you just want to hand out flyers for a band or go put stickers on something, you know, like you can play a role in, many many ways or just by being there and just participating and just paying at the door and going to a concert like you're already a huge part of the scene or buying a band's merch or wearing their t-shirt in your selfies you know and tagging that band or like you know the band will share that you know like well, there, most, there's so most many <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, well there's so many there's so many uh 
there's so many ways for someone to be a part of the scene, you know, and just, just being there is important enough, you know? I agree, man. So what, what are you doing nowadays with Night Demon? You obviously released a couple singles last year, which, uh, which was really cool to, to kind of, from marketing perspective, to, to see that. Cause not a lot of bands would even do what five yeah. singles or five, yeah. or five or six singles you know, yeah. each what every two months or correct me if every I'm wrong, five or... weeks. Yeah. Every so five starting weeks. April, yeah. So starting April 3rd, we did a, we did a lyric video, a digital single, a seven inch vinyl and a behind the scenes video for a single. So we did that five times in a row, five, every five weeks, starting April of 2020. Our plan was to be on tour that whole time. And every five weeks when a single c- came out, we would add that to the live set. Obviously, those plans were derailed by the pandemic, but we still had everybody's attention. The singles sold out like the day they went on sale every time. We didn't do any pre-order or announcement that they were coming. They just happened. They kept coming and coming. People probably didn't know when it was going to end. But uh, but yeah, so that was a successful campaign that we ran. Um, and just we were writing songs that were just not very cohesive with each other for an album, but they 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 were they stood on their own. And they each deserved their own artwork. And, and we just thought that was the right approach for that. So um, this year, uh, 2022, March 25th, we're releasing a full length titled Year of the Demon, which is a compilation of those five singles. So the B-sides were only available on the vinyl singles. They've never been available anywhere else digitally or, or on any physical format. So now they will all be available with the A-sides in a 10 song collection on LP, CD and cassette. So that hits March 25th, um, and that's the idea with that. We were, able, we were able to capture that year, the year of the demon, which was it was, it was demonic in many ways, you know, um, and now we're able to release that in a, in a, in a compilation. So we're, we're really proud of that. We're proud of that. It keeps our discography clean, and uh, it's cool to have all those on one collection. Now, I, lastly, I want to thank you so much again for giving me a, a couple minutes of your time to do this. I, I, like I said, I'm a huge fan of yours, huge fan of the Night Demon stuff. Uh, but what is next in the Night Demon camp as far as a full length record goes? Will we see one in the next coming years? Or yes, uh, we have a full length record coming out November fourth of this year. So, y- you know, we've been active with this stuff for a long time, but we feel that. Night Demon is a touring band and we don't, uh, we, we just, we wanted to make sure that we, we, we have proper touring cycles with all of our releases. Uh, we've done so since the beginning, you know, we toured on just an EP for, for two years. We did the same with Curse of the Damned, brought it around the world three times. And we did the same with Darkness Remains and even extended that campaign by doing a live album. Um, with the singles, we never got to tour on it. There's 10 songs here. So it's like, this will come out March 25th. We're going to, we're going to do a special release show in Southern California and release a beer based around it too. And we're going to, we're going to do a U.S. tour and then a full European tour, a lot of summer festivals, come back for another run in the U S in the fall, which in a very special package that we'll be announcing soon. And immediately when the touring off of year of the demon concludes, We'll have a new full length record for all you guys, and we're gonna hit the road immediately after that too. So, we're we've we've been stockpiling this stuff. We want it to get the attention it deserves in a live environment, but we've been we've been backlogging it to a point where it's just gonna be consistent. We're not gonna stop. We're just gonna keep going, and we're gonna keep these cycles back to back. You know, but yeah, it's we've got stuff in the can, man. It's it's ready to go. I love it. Well, Jarvis, again, thank you so much again for, for joining me on here and uh, for another episode of Poppets Corner, guys. We're out of here. Cheers. Yeah.